everyone. Welcome to tonight's Postgres World Meetup, um, Postgres Automation and Hyperscaling. Uh, thanks to you who are all here live. Thanks to all of you who are here on our live stream. Um, my name is Lindsay Hooper. I'm one of the Postgres World organizers, um, and I'm sort of one of the organizers for the evening. A uh, little bit about us, and then I'm going to hand it off. So Postgres Conference is an international organization hosting events in the US, Canada, South Africa, China, and the EU. Uh, we're an advocacy and education project with the goal of bringing the best in Postgres and Postgres-related content to the open source community. So a few logistical things, and then I'm gonna hand it off. So one, thank you to Materialize for having us. This is a beautiful space. Y'all who aren't here, you might not be able to see it, but it's great. Um, one, questions are encouraged. Um, they're gonna be answered towards the end of the session. If you're here in person and there's something really pressing, raise your hand um, and our lovely moderator will call on you, but otherwise questions will be fielded at the end. For those of you on the live stream, um, I will be fielding the questions live and then I will get them to our moderator towards the end. Um, who's our moderator though? So first we have uh, Roshan Jobanputra. Nice. Beautiful. Um, who is a member of the technical staff here at Materialize. Um, and then our speaker is Luigi Nardi, the CEO and founder at DB Tune. Um, I'm gonna give it over to you guys now. Thanks for everything and you'll see me at the end. Thanks. Enjoy. Thanks for the kind introduction. Thank you. Uh, yeah, hi everyone. Um, yeah, so as Lindsay said, I work here at Materialize. I work, I'm a software engineer and I work on a lot of our storage systems. Um, for those of you that don't know, we are a streaming kind of like operational data warehouse, but we uh, use the Postgres uh, protocol as our interface for customers. So we're big Postgres fans here. Um, in the past, I have uh, worked in a couple of uh, different roles where I operated and maintained a Postgres instance uh, behind you know, large SaaS software application. And I'm curious to hear about Luigi's um, thoughts around, you know, how we could have tuned it better, dealt with scaling issues and performance uh, problems that we, we faced over that time. Awesome, cool. And Luigi, if you don't mind giving us your background. Yeah, thank you for having me, first of all. Thank you, everybody, for coming coming out. Um, right, so I'm the founder and CEO of, of dbTune. Very excited to be here. Um, we started the DB Tune journey out of research at Stanford University back in 2017. And um, it's been a fantastic journey, um, really learning a lot from the Postgres community in general and uh, trying to combine this piece of like academic research into like a real world pro product uh, and working with very large corporations across the globe. So very, very exciting. Great. And what, do you, what is it about Postgres and databases and, and performance optimization that you find so exciting? So I, th I think the, the new, well, perhaps not so new anymore, um, thing that people really care about these days is um, it's not just performance, uh, it's not just price, it's about price performance. And, and um, I think Postgres is, is an amazing project. And, and um, if you're here, I probably don't need to convince you uh, about that. Um, the, um, it's an amazing project when you when when it works well and and you know often you need to do tuning uh, to make it work well and be uh, responsive and, and so on and um there is a there is a lot of opportunity to make postgres better by uh, making it run uh, efficiently and effectively and so the the idea of um, taking uh, community postgres and making you know making adjustments to uh, to, to 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 your postgres instance autonomously and basically shifting left the whole development, uh, taking something that uh, is usually done uh, in, a, in, a, in a reactive way and make it more proactive. Um, and so this, this helps uh, everybody to get better price performance and, and this has a huge um, benefit down, downstream for every, uh, any company out there. Great. How often do you uh, encounter a workload that requires custom tuning to, to make work well? Right, so in practice, um, the most common way is to use a, a, the full configuration of Postgres. Uh, and I was just talking with Alex uh, back, back there uh, about the fact that um, many, many people um, 
that use Postgres, use this basic uh, default configuration of Postgres, which is not by itself uh, like a bad, bad uh, configuration. It's, uh, it's just a configuration that doesn't really often uh, target your own uh, use case. Um, it's uh, made in a way that's very conservative. Uh, so if you run Postgres on a small device, you, you will not crash your device, right? But often we don't run Postgres on a small machine. Uh, we are often running Postgres on a, on a big server machine. And so in that case, when you when you run on, on these bigger instances, it really matters to change the configuration of Postgres with respect to uh, those bigger machines. And then there is the component, which is, and, and by the way, we often also migrate from one machine to the other machine. So yeah. anytime that you migrate, you need to, kind of reconsider re that configuration of Postgres again. And then there is the application uh, side of things, right? So if you have a read-heavy workload or a write-heavy workload or a mixed workload, an analytical workload or you know whatever you're running on your machine, that, that really matters as well. Uh, and that needs to be taken into account uh, to set up your, your, your Postgres instance. And so when, um, when it's the best moment to, to tune, it's a, number of scenarios and those are some some of them okay and you see so you mentioned the type of workload matters a lot and when i think of that i think of um, tuning like application queries indexes things like that but i'm curious on your take of when do you when does it make sense to look at parameter tuning instead of just mm -hmm. like application level kind of query and index tuning right that's that's a great question so when we talk about tuning or database tuning or postgres tuning we and that, that's really um spot on to make this difference, right? So there are so many things that we can tune. Uh, so we can tune queries, we can tune database management system parameters, we can tune indices, we can tune operating system parameters as well and, and other things, right? Um, dbTune focuses for now on database management system parameter tuning, which is one of these things. Uh, it's very important and very often when you tune one thing, you want to retune your parameters as well because they go hand in hand. So if you change the queries, you should also change your configuration again because technically what you're doing is you're changing your workload and your workload will run best if you also adjust the parameters. So by automating the process of adjusting the parameters with dbTune, you can focus on the other tuning aspects of Postgres and then you basically can, can have this other part which is fully, uh, fully automated. So in terms of what you can do by tuning indices, for example, you can get multiple, like several other magnitude performance improvement, which is something that we absolutely need to do, right? In terms of query uh, tuning as well, if you rewrite your queries, uh, you can get, again, many magnitude uh, improvement in, 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 in the speed of, of your queries as well. And so parameter tuning perhaps is not, um, you know, 100 times faster but it still uh, can be like 10x uh, faster, depending on how uh, bad your baseline is. We have experience on um, you know, uh, 13x uh, improvement in performance. If you do manual tuning, we have, um, um, there was, a, there was a, a Postgres shop that wrote a blog recently where they were doing manual tuning and then they were running dbTune uh, just to check what was the difference. And dbTune was still able to outperform the manual tuner but now it's doing it fully automatically, right? And and that's uh, the real value because you know, you don't need to do this fairly boring task by right? changing parameters, very uh, challenging and, and also kind of uh, boring, right? Because uh, you may want to focus on more interesting, intellectually interesting uh, tasks uh, as well. So all these things are very important. Um, I think the fact that we can start to automate some of these things help also with the other things because now you can focus on some things and then just push the dbtune button to uh, optimize the other things, right? So that's that's the, the way I like to think about this. Cool. And so expanding on the value of parameter tuning, like what are the specific optimizations that you're looking to to achieve there? Are, are there specific metrics or things that you care about mostly? Right. So it's um, I think the, the the things that people care about uh, when they talk about performance tuning in Postgres, it's mainly um, average so latency and throughput. Right. So, and then there is some form of latency and some form of throughput. Throughput is often transactions per second or TPS, uh, and latency is often average query on time or P99 or P95. Right. And so, those are the things that usually people care about. And uh, we, um, we, we offer um, throughput and latency optimization. 
we give the user the ability to choose what they want, but the default, uh, which is perhaps the most common um, metric to optimize, is usually average query runtime, um, which um, you know is basically you know how long your queries take to run, uh, divided by the number of the number of queries that run. But as simple as that, right? So average query runtime. Do you ever encounter um, trade-offs between achieving different objectives or different sort of um, outcomes for, for what the tuning is, is intending to do? And how do you balance those types of trade-offs? Right, so technically, if your machine is not overloaded, you cannot really improve throughput, right? So throughput is a little more specific than average query. You can kind of always improve average query on time, but if your workload is not uh, really stressing your machine, it, you can throw one more query and you're, you know, that will not change. So you need to kind of know a little more when you optimize for throughput. Okay. Right? These things are usually inversely correlated, if you see what I mean. So throughput, you want it to go up and latency, you want it to go down. So, and often when you optimize one, you get the other one also to benefit. Okay. But it's not always the case for this reason, right? So if your machine is not overloaded, for example, throughput will not, uh, you know, be affected as much. And, but you can still improve average query on time. When you, so that's why we have that as a default as in the system as well. Got it. And when you say overloaded, you mean like a machine with, you know, CPU pegged and network I.O. bandwidth and stuff is, is pegged, or is there something else too that? Yeah, I, I mean, I'm not using a very formal definition. Okay, yeah. Like it's, it's, uh, it's, it's spinning. Sure, mm -hmm. that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I guess the other question I have that's somewhat related is how you differentiate tuning uh, like a workload versus preparing it for scale or scaling a workload, and are those conceptually the same or different? When you say scaling, you mean uh, or so if, if you're if you're vertical. basically it, mostly vertical. If your workload is increasing mm -hmm. dramatically, does tuning um, is that part of the like should that be preemptive or, and or reactive to that mm -hmm. scenario? Happening? So the uh, vertical. So in, in, in an era where we run a lot of things in the cloud, people do change quite regularly as well in you know, going to bigger instances and so on. And I think that's really where you can get the benefit of an automated approach with, uh, with DB2. Because when you change your server machine that you're using, the configuration of the system needs to be readjusted to, you know, now you have more RAM, for example. So that means that shared buffers, for example, will need to be perhaps adjusted to that. Your work mem, which is the memory that is used by uh, running a query, uh, and you can do, uh, you know, it's the memory allocated for 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 a query, uh, and uh, so if you have more space in, in your more RAM now, maybe you want to have that work mem to be a little larger so that when you do sorting, it, they can just fit there. You don't need to go back and spill to disk, for example, things like that. Uh, the number of the number of like, workers and you know uh, this kind of parallelism as well is affected by these parameters. So every time you move from one instance to another instance, it's very convenient to redo the tuning because you will get the best performance again. And so in an era where we do change quite regularly, especially with, with this new cloud um, you know era that we are in, uh, it's convenient to be able to not to do this manually all the time. So every time you change your instance, you basically push a button, right? And that gets done for you. That's that's very convenient. So every time every time that happens, um, uh, yeah, so that's how I see the vertical scaling, uh, which doesn't go only up. Yeah. It also, you know, people go up, but they also come back depending on, you know, Thanksgiving or, you know, uh, moments of the year, seasons and, and things like that, right? That's fair. And you mentioned, you know, deploying on the cloud and things like that. Are there things that you can tune that, are more possible when you're running things yourself versus using like a managed database service or, or is, are things fairly um, equivalent there? Right. So the uh, database as a service is, um, I think, a, an extremely interesting, right, right now it's happening, right? So in the last few years, we've seen really a raise of uh, this type of services that are extremely popular. Um, if you're a startup company, you probably just start from there right away. So there is. Uh, a lot of new users in, in that area. doesn't mean that self-hosted is not growing. Self-hosted yeah. is also growing. It's just the pace of growth is quite, quite different. Okay. Um, the databases of service providers are pretty intentional in 
trying to do as much as they can like for you right because you're technically is a fully managed service right that's how sometimes they call it data business service fully managed service but technically is not really fully managed there are many things that are not managed at all and uh, parameter tuning is one of these things that is not really managed uh, and so there is still an opportunity to basically make your uh, debus uh, more efficient by tuning the parameters and what uh, the uh, service providers do is that they provide an interface which is also programmatic pro uh, so it can be accessed uh, programmatically uh, where you can basically change the configuration even if you don't have access to the instance itself because it's behind the dbus you can still access the configuration of the system and so if you um, don't believe that this is a fully managed service which is often the case, especially for configuration of Postgres, then you can go and change these parameters in the same way we can do in, in a self-hosted. Uh, so the, the way we interact with this DBAS uh, instances is slightly different because we need to use this API that the cloud providers like uh, AWS and, and Azure and, and Google Cloud SQL offer to you, yeah. but it's just a different way to access the same thing. And so often you can achieve uh, similar results uh, through through this interface, basically, and accessing it behind the scenes. The only difference is that cloud providers give you a decent default uh, since they know what's the size of the machine you're, you're renting, basically. So they give you this decent default. So shared buffers, for example, which is, I think, 128 megabytes as of default Postgres, which is extremely small. Uh, it becomes 25% of RAM uh, on, a, on, a, on a deep bus solution, which is you know, pretty good. Um, of course, it's not adapting to your application specifically, but at least it's adapting to the size of the machine, which is which is a good uh, starting point. Yeah, that makes sense. Are there any common pitfalls that people fall into when they're trying to tune a deb database? Yeah, so that's that's a great question. So the the status quo is to basically uh, so you have so first of all. There are 300 plus parameters in Postgres today, and th there is a linear trend, uh, which is basically getting more parameters over the years. I think it was 100 plus parameters, I think 20 years ago, uh, and now it's 300. Now of these 300 parameters, not all of them matter for performance. In fact, many don't matter at all. Like think about the name of a log file, does it really matter, right? Um, but there are, there are at least probably between 15 and 20 parameters that really matter for your for your performance. And if you look at this 20 parameter kind of optimization space, um, it's already a massive optimization space. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I was calculating this on 12 parameters. It's about 1 trillion possible configuration of, of the system, 1 trillion. So 1 trillion is, is a big number. I, I actually really bad at imagining numbers myself. Uh, <laughs> so I think I created this image, I like, I like space. So I, I created this image with the moon. And so if you take $1 bill and you put it, like you stuck it up like a, a trillion times, you basically get half the way to the moon. And now the problem that you're trying to solve with this configuration thing is, configuration optimization thing, is to basically find this $1 bill, which gives you this uh, peak performance practice you're not really looking for one dollar bill probably there are a bunch of dollar bills that you know achieve similar performance so you're fine with that but it's still a very big stack and you you know trying to solve a very complex combinatorial optimization problem basically. Okay. Um, um, and so the status quo going back to that is that people have in mind this maybe five parameters they care about because that's all they know about this right and um and then they basically start tuning one parameter. They just see how the performance changes. And then at some point they get something that is a little better and they stop tuning that parameter. Then they go on the second parameter. They have a list of five, right? And so they go on the second parameter, they change this parameter. At some point this may make a little better or not. Yeah. They stop tuning that parameter. So they have a budget of time allocated to this task. You know, there are pressures of your manager asking, you know, <laughs> fast, do it fast. And yeah, so, yeah. And then you go to the third parameter and fourth and fifth. And so this is a, an interesting approach, right? Because it's very controlled. You know, you're doing one after the other. The problem is that very often you're basically, so imagine this optimization space two-dimensional. You're basically going, uh, you're going like this, but you're never going 
if you see what I mean, right? So if, if this is one dimension, this is another dimension, you're basically trying to optimize by moving one parameter at a time. And so there are spaces of this optimization space that you cannot reach if you do that. that. And that's the, the really the, the, the only way that people do this, basically, right? With an automated approach and using, you know, machine learning probabilistic models, what you can do is that you can change multiple parameters at the same time and basically uncover regions in the optimization space that are much more effective and efficient, right? And so we have, um, so if you search uh, for, for YouTube, uh, my name, you will find a bunch of talks. The, the one that we gave, uh, I gave at um, Postgres uh, conference in India, for example, is a pretty good talk that shows a little bit of this thing. So I would invite you, every, everybody, to go on, on YouTube and find this PGConf India talk. Uh, and I show, I show an example there where, um, you know, if you plot this two-dimensional response, performance response surface, you see that by changing one parameter, you get pretty good. If you change the other parameter, you may get a little better. But if you change both of them, you get an additional boost in performance that you will never have found if you were not changing these two parameters at the same time. So I think that's an interesting, uh, you know, intellectual kind of understanding of the problem that many people don't really have. Yeah. And they think that by optimizing every single parameter at the time, they can reach that level of optimization, which is not the case. Now, if you go from two dimensions, one dimension, two dimensions, if you go to five to 10 dimensions, it becomes literally impossible for a, for a poor human being like, like me to you know, find this manually, right? But uh, machines work, work differently and they can quantify things in a different way. You can estimate uh, uncertainty levels and things like that. So probabilistic mo modeling helps you to basically achieve the type of um, understanding of the problem based on your workload and machine that we cannot really do uh, manually. Yep. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And it seems really tedious to do that and, and try to achieve anything that, that is optimal. Um, I guess in, in, the, in history, like how has automation played into the, the process of database tuning? Right, so th technically this is a problem that is as old as Postgres, right? I know, 40 year old problem. Uh, because as soon as you had Postgres running, you were probably running uh, with performance issues. And uh, there were parameters in Postgres from the very early stages. Uh, and so this is a very old problem. Um, it's just a complex problem. Uh, and uh, there is a lot of fear as well. If you're a fairly young, uh, Postgres engineer, uh, you will fear trying to adjust these parameters because you don't really know what's going to happen. You don't fully understand these parameters. You don't have enough time to learn about these parameters. So you learn, you read a bunch of blogs yeah. and you just learn a bunch. Maybe you change some things, but there is always this kind of fear, um, you know, feeling, um, and, um, so very old problem, but really underestimated and under, um, under, under, um, you know, not tackled as much, I would say. And um, it's, you know, an, an interesting take to do this fully automatically and 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 taking into account your application, I think, can make a big difference. Yeah. Um, you should probably mention there are there is an open source solution called PG Tune which is a, a solution that do, uh, does take into account your machine size, but it doesn't take into account your application. Uh, so it's, it's great. It's uh, used very well adopted by, who knows PG Tune here? Do you know PG Tune? Yeah, like quite a few people, yeah. Uh, and um, very well adopted, very easy to use. It's just a simple interface where you can just insert your RAM um, size and uh, how many CPUs you have and things like that. And you push a button, it generates this file configuration file and you take and install in, in your in your instance yeah. and you're done. Uh, and that's great, it gives you quite some performance improvement, but at the same time, it doesn't really look at what's actually happening on your machine. And so this idea of moving the needle and having some, an agent that is basically monitoring and observing on the fly what's happening and then adjusting your instance based on what's being observed it's the new step and it's a new step that we can do now with all the you know the new improvements in in you know machine learning and automation in general 
uh, and that's uh, that's that's why it's happening now and it wasn't happening uh, a little while ago. That makes sense. Could you just give us kind of like a high level primer about how the machine learning um, that DB2 does can can help optimize uh, you know an active production database? Right. So the way it works is pretty simple. Uh, so usually, if you're doing this manually, you would um, you know look at what's happening on, on, on the machine with some Grafana or whatever you're monitoring tool. You can use all sorts of uh, tools to do that. Um, and then um, try to learn a little bit about your workload uh, and uh, look at this configuration of Postgres, uh, which is basically one file with all these different parameters. And based on your understanding on how these parameters work, you basically go back and, and, and try to combine you know, this machine plus workload plus whatever is your current configuration and you make some changes, then you monitor, you learn from this monitoring, new monitoring data and you integrate in your, in your head like this additional information now and say, oh, interesting, maybe now this is happening here. So let's change again the configuration file and then you monitor again, and you learn a bunch more, and then you keep iterating in this process of like, I change something, I learn something, I act upon something, right? So that's that's the loop. And what we are doing with this automation uh, approach is that we try to mimic that behavior, right? So the agent changes something, learn something, and then act on something, right? So that's the same loop, but now it's an agent that has a lot of domain specific knowledge and it's, it's basically monitoring and, and learning from, from the response of the system. And when we say learning, um, it's, it's about learning some model of this performance surface on, on, the, on the Postgres instance. And this model is a probabilistic model, uh, often based on, on um, you know, re regression models, right? which uh, also give you just the prediction. So if, if you give you a new, new configuration of the system, you will be able to predict the performance that you expect um, from, from that configuration because you, this model tells you that. So it's a pre prediction, but it also gives you the uncertainty with respect to that prediction. And the uncertainty is something really, really important. And that's what makes me call it probabilistic model. Probabilistic because it gives you the prediction and it gives you also the uncertainty over the prediction. That's why it's a probabilistic model. And once you have this beautiful piece of, you know, probabilistic model, then you can use that to understand where, where the optimal configuration of the system is. And now you, you can basically um, explore this model, uh, which is a multidimensional, multivariate model, and the uncertainty in a way that you can navigate this model. And over a few changes of the system, in the same way the manual tuner will do, go through a few changes, you change, you learn better model, you act upon uh, this uh, learning experience you had, and you do that a few times until basically you converge towards some optimal configuration of the system. And this all happens in literally three hours, right? So you start the process of tuning, and after three hours, you get the optimal configuration of the system. And that's where a lot of the innovation and a lot of the research um, comes in. So research in, in, uh, in machine learning and AI and um, yeah. Do you, the, the tuning process that the model's doing, is it based on training over some existing you know, data set from like a, a real production workload or, or is it more um, uh, training or it's, it's more just kind of based on the, the actual workload of the system it's being optimized against? So it's a great question. So it's a combination of both, okay. right? So since you would like to provide um, a, a, a sh optimization session, which is short, you would like to provide a quick answer, right? Uh, so it's good to learn from the past, from other things, yeah. uh, but then you also need to make it very specific to your application and what's happening uh, at that moment in time. So the combination of these two things is what makes this uh, process fairly short in time. And does it do, does it, does it focus on a specific set of parameters first as like kind of the big heavyweight ones and things like that, that it um, then feeds off of, or, or is it pretty 
like you know random as far as the first guess in this probabilistic approach and then yeah ra ran work? random is a is a is a dangerous uh, <laughs> word uh, yeah, yeah. but it's um st stochastic would be perhaps the the, okay. the, the better word Fair. so it's based on st st so there is stochasticity in everything here sure. right so if, if you if you know machines are very noisy so yeah. there's there's all sort of uh, you're running in the cloud, so you, you can have all sort of like behavior in the cloud as okay. well, right? So the, all that needs to be taken into uh, into into account. Okay. Um, on the question, uh, is this doing just more important ones first and then the other ones? Well, the answer is no, because of what I was saying before. So if you optimize them together, you achieve better results. So okay. you don't want to just focus on one or two first and then go on the other ones. Okay. It's really a holistic type of optimization needs to happen like in uh, in a holistic manner. Okay, mm -hmm. that's fair. And as far as the training data goes, if a workload comes in that has never been, like there's a type of workload that your, your model hasn't been uh, trained on at all yeah. before, how does that work? Is, does that take longer to get to the you know, optimal configuration or can it, also fail in reaching, you know, maybe like a, a, a global maximum. Right? right. So we um, design design this optimization space in a way that we are pretty confident in. In three hours, you can optimize whatever new workload you have. Okay. Um, so there are. So if we go a little deeper on on the research side of things, uh, we can say that we have theoretical guarantees that if you run long enough, you will find the optimum. Which is very comfortable. Like intellectually, it's good to know that if you run long enough, yeah. you will get what you want. Okay. And that's actually not obvious at all. Uh, okay. There are many algorithms in the machine learning area that you know you're never sure that if you convert or you know if results are good, so you, you're fine. But there yeah. is not theoretical guarantees that if you do it again, you know you will get you will get something really yeah. really really good as well. Yeah. So we have those theoretical guarantees, uh, but in, technically, when you when you then do it in in the real world in practice. You know, you care less about that, and it's more about like practically and empirically. Uh, you know, if if I run this hundred times, uh, you know, would I see this happening in in this amount of time, right? In yep. these three hours I was describing before, and so it's uh, it's a lot of empirical, uh, you know, analysis. And what we see is that we we can reliably do this in in three hours. Okay. Uh, How does the tuning process account for like pathological configurations? So. For example, if you um, reduce or if you increase the time between checkpoints, you might uh, make it worse in terms of a, a, a you know recovery scenario, but might increase your performance in the near term. Like how do you mm -hmm. how does that how does the model account for that? So there are a few uh, parameters that really depend on the application. Okay, and we don't want to mess up your application. So there are a couple of things that we don't touch on Barcos by design. Okay because it's an application level decision which we don't feel comfortable taking for you. And uh, checkpointing is one of them. Uh, the number of connections is another one. The, those two are pretty much the, I would say maybe the only ones. Okay. Uh, but those are, those are things that you need to consciously decide by yourself and we don't feel comfortable in changing them. Uh, let's um, remember that this thing can run on a side instance in your pre-prod environment, but can also run in production. And we have many people that run this in production. And uh, if you run in production, you don't want to mess uh, your, you know, your, your production system. And so we need to be really careful in doing this very safely. And there are a number of uh, guardrails that makes this process very, very safe uh, to, 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 to be run in, in, in production. And so this couple of things I mentioned, yeah. uh, we, we don't feel comfortable changing it because it's an application decision that needs to come from the application owner uh, more than like, the, like an automated approach. And, and if you're running this on a productive application, how does the iterative process deal with, you know, like potentially faulty configuration changes that could cause uh, an out of memory error or something like that? Right. Like, how do you avoid right. that kind of a yeah? So situation? Um, the this is a, this is really what, what I was uh, describing in terms of guard, guardrails. Okay. So um, the um, you know the approach is active, meaning that we are actively changing your configurations over a window uh, of three hours, as I was mentioning before. Uh, but at the same time, there is a monitoring, uh, continuous monitoring during that period of time where you're basically monitoring uh, things like CPU, uh, RAM, uh, and, and disk, and IOPS. You're, you're, doing, you're doing this monitoring uh, over, over time. And uh, you can, um, basically, when you, when you install a new configuration, you're running for a certain amount of time, you're also monitoring all these things. 
And so there is a common practice in Postgres, which is you will never want your instance to run above 90% of RAM. And so that's something that we can monitor. And we are actually very, uh, so since it's automated, it can monitor in real time. And as soon as a new configuration does that, we exit that configuration and bring the system back to a safe mode, basically, right? Because you're basically putting your system in danger if you lose more than 90% of RAM. And so that can be all automated. And that's what we call guard, guard rails. That's right? fair. Mm -hmm. um, so there are a few, few of those. This is one of them. That makes sense. You mentioned earlier that some customers don't like some work or some run it on their production instance. They're they're kind of like transactional instance, and maybe some run it on a on a replica of that. Like, can they get the same performance if they're not experiencing the same workload at that time? Or how does that yeah, work? so that, that's a, that's an interesting question. I think it's um, you know in in um, in the overall area of machine learning and AI and research on those topics, there is this concept of basically um, simulators right and reality gap so reality gap basically means i would like to run this in the real world but maybe i can run it in my simulator and then bring the results in the real world right so it's a one shot thing then because i do everything over here and in one shot i just use the solution on the real on the, on the real world so depending on how accurate the simulator is you know, bringing this in the real world will have less of an impact or difference, yeah. the delta the, of impact, right? Uh, and that's what is called the reality gap. The reality gap is how big is the difference when I move from the simulator environment to my, uh, to my real world. And so the reality gap is something that is a bit of outside our control yeah. uh, because very often large enterprise customers, they have... Um, you know, they have this as a, as a way to develop um, and, and test things, right? So, and if they want to develop and test things, this simulation environment or pre-prod environment needs to be fairly close to what's happening in the real world. In practice, that's not always the case. Yeah. Um, and so that's a little bit out, out of our control. Um, but, you know, you do what you can do, right? So if you don't, if you absolutely don't want to run anything in production uh, like this, uh, because you're you're in a very conservative um, industry, for example, or something like that, then that's pretty much the only thing that you can do. Uh, okay. Even if you're doing it manually, uh, you will have a lot of pushbacks on every any change, right? Yeah. And so in that case, you just do it on the side. There are, there are tools that help you with this uh, in Postgres, like, for example, PG Replay. Uh, you can use PG Replay to replicate um, uh, an instance. Um, and people use that a lot. Um, yeah, that, that definitely makes sense. Um, I guess uh, a somewhat related question. I'm curious about the practice of when you'd want to apply this tuning in a scenario where you are potentially dealing with like the limits of your database instance. So if you have a workload where you're planning to scale up the instance size, for example, on RDS, because you constantly are, are hitting some sort of resource limit and your queries are timing out, things like that. How do you take into account, or how would you go about that process, mm -hmm. given that you could you know, grow the instance size or, or use the tuning mechanisms that you have? Right, so usually when people do that kind of moving up and down, they yeah. usually don't do three levels above. Yeah. Uh, and they usually have a similar application. So it's a continuum, application change in a continuum and scaling up vertically up and down also is kind of a continuum it's a discrete but it's a, almost a continuum right so okay. you go a little bit up you don't go like so which basically means that you usually by having your current instance well optimized you are in a good spot to basically move your instance and then as soon as you move your your instance you then run a tuning session as soon as you have it there okay and then you basically uh, get again the best efficiency, but you need to you need to migrate first and then um, migrate if you want to call it the data square, scale it up, or, okay. um, uh, before being able to do the tuning. Um, there are some basic things that DB Tune would recommend to you, okay. which is even prior to scaling, which is um, the shared buffers, for example, the the um, you know 
at least starting from 25% or something like that. Yeah. Um, for the um, things called max uh, parallel workers, okay, uh, which is another parameter that um, uh, it's recommended to have uh, roughly at the number of virtual CPUs. It's a little more complex than that, but uh, and those are things that you know division would would recommend to you uh, in starting with the instance size. Start, that, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and so that's um, yeah. But you 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 know if you want to really have the benefits of this, you need to migrate and then optimize the new instance because that's. That's that's really representative of what what it's going to look like. Cool. Yeah, that, that definitely makes sense. Um, I guess the other question is is maybe implied, but cost and how that relates to this whole process. Like, how does that? How do these these um, I guess new abilities translate into cost reduction over time? Right. So that's a that's a very interesting question, right? So the the uh, modus operandi of solving performance problems these days is to take your instance. You have a performance issue. You double the size of the instance. You solve the performance issue, right? You solve the problem in the engineering department, but the finance department now is scratching their head because you create a problem in their budget, and it's a big problem. It's usually double the problem, right? Um, so, and there is this new practice uh, in uh, DevOps or platform engineering these days. Um, called uh, FinOps, uh, Financial DevOps. Do you know FinOps? Have you heard of FinOps before? Yeah, a few, a few people. Uh, I think this is becoming a more like, um, um, you know, common term that people use more and more, uh, but it's still becoming like uh, well-known. And so uh, FinOps, what it does is Financial DevOps, and it's basically this practice of making DevOps folks or platform engineers these days, they're, that's how they're called these days, so uh, how to basically make the finance department connected with the DevOps um, team in a way that um, you know things run in, a, in an efficient manner, in an optimized manner in terms of the, the overall cost of platform, right? Yeah. And so this is where the engineering department, like people in this room, can really contribute in a, in a massive way, right? And, and there's, a, there's a big opportunity there because if you run your software efficiently, then you don't need your instance to be as big. And so you're in a position where if you do that process, you can literally shrink your instance, right? So if you, uh, again, if you, if you go back to this presentation I give, I often show this in a, in a visual manner where we were optimizing an RDS instance and we were literally able to double the performance, uh, which meant that you could literally halve the size of your RDS instance. And uh, the RDS instance was, uh, I think, $17,000 a year, uh, just for one instance. And uh, by halving the size, you were saving $8,000, roughly, uh, 8000 something. Um, and that's all savings, basically, that you now um, can uh, you know, bring back to your manager and say, look, what, we can run this on a smaller instance. This match uh, budget you can even give me a bonus, uh, you know, or uh, use that uh, to do something else, right? Uh, and that's that's great. Now think about having that type of savings every year on one instance, but in practice, um, you know, companies have tens and tens of these instances. I was talking with someone before. I was saying that um, they running, uh, I think, a thousand instances um, in a local company right here. And so, thousand instances, you multiply that a thousand. You know, eight thousand dollars of savings, and you multiply that by a thousand, you just get very quickly into the multi-million dollar type of savings, uh, and that's very sizable, even for large companies, right? And so there is an opportunity for us who are in the engineering department to really bring like this huge benefits from for for, for the overall organization. Of course, uh, the management will really like that because if you manage to shrink the, the you know the cost of running these platforms. Um, your infrastructure cost, that literally means that the market capitalization of the company itself will go up. And CEOs and CTOs and CFOs, they really love that kind of stuff, right? So because all they want is that market capitalization of the company goes up. And so if you, if you, you know, as, a, as an engineer, you can actually contribute to those kind of high level strategic objectives of your CEO by running your fleet in an efficient manner. Great. And just wanted to add one more thing. Sure. 
uh, on the sustainability side of things, right? So if you run your software efficiently, you also affect, you know, literally the CO2 consumption of your company. And that's something that perhaps is not as important uh, yet, but it's becoming increasingly important for many reasons. Of course, you know, climate change and all these kind of things. But also for, you know, especially, you know, younger generations are extremely uh, uh, active on this. And, and if, you're, if you're a company that is, um, uh, you know, careful about, about your brand as well, that's also important. So having efficient uh, software these days and being able to, you know, contribute to the uh, climate change uh, area as well, it's, it's extremely important. So by optimizing your database instances, you also achieve better sustainability. And that's being quantified now. Quantified, meaning that in Europe already in 2025, at the end of the year, enterprise companies with more than 250 people, they will have to report their CO2 consumption. So there will be a number that they will need to monitor over the year and report back at the end of the year. And so that's a first step. Um, and I think the European Union is kind of leading the way, but many other countries uh, around the globe will follow uh, that that um, that that process. So the first step is monitoring, and I'm assuming that in a few years there will be some sort of like cap, right? And and then at that point, um, companies will really care about uh, not having too much CO two emissions um, because there will be a penalty if you go above a certain threshold. And so this is happening. It's not there yet, not quite yet, uh, but it's certainly happening. And you can do go on uh, Google Cloud, for example. You can monitor uh, your CO two consumption. There is there is a dashboard that gives you that today, which is amazing. I think Google uh, already provides that. Um, I think you can do the same on, on AWS as well. And so these things are happening, right? So and they're they will be massively important, not just for your organization, but for the society as a whole. That's yeah, great great impact. Save money and, and save the environment. Um, I think the last question that I've got is just where you see the future going in terms of database tuning and, and scaling and how that um, how that might evolve over the next five, say, five years. Right. Um, right. So I like to think about this question in, in a couple of different ways. Of course, there is, um, there is the overall database area uh, and there is the automation and machine learning and what can we do at the intersection of these two things? Um, you know, in, in, in terms of uh, the databases, we've seen, we've seen a lot of things that are really happening and they're becoming really, really important. You've been seeing like vector databases, we've been seeing extensions of both PG Vector, for example, for Postgres, which is extremely important to support um, embeddings, which are it's AI, generative AI uh, applications and so on. Uh, we've seen things like uh, being able to easily migrate uh, from one cloud provider to the other cloud provider, uh, which is extremely important, especially for um, uh, governance and, and, and flexibility for enterprise, enterprise companies not to get locked in with, with one vendor. So it's extremely important. Um, so there is, there, is, there is a lot happening in that. Uh, the bus uh, business service is becoming absolutely crucial for, for many companies. And, there is more and more automation that gets into uh, into deep bus solutions. So deep bus solutions already take care of uh, uh, um, sort of each uh, high availability HA availability things or backups. So you don't need to think about those things anymore, which is great. But there is so much more that can be done in terms of automation and DB tune is basically in in, in that, that space. But in general, I would like to kind of go above that for a second and think about two things. So the first one is using automation to improve systems, machine learning for systems. And the other direction is making better systems to improve machine learning, right? So this is an area that I'm very excited about and I've been running a conference uh, called uh, MLCs, Euro MLCs is the European uh, version of that, uh, machine learning and systems. And, and I think there is a, there is a big opportunity uh, to um, to work on 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 these two um, you know angles, so when you think about PG Vector, for example, you're making database uh, system better to support uh, machine learning, right? So your your embeddings are calculated, uh, you, know, you know, are used in a in a in a better way, more efficient way, and so on. So that's the direction of like improving systems to make better uh, machine learning. Uh, but I'm actually really interested in the opposite direction, where you basically 
try to increase the level of automation and using machine learning is one of the ways you can do that to improve computer systems. And I think there is a huge opportunity these days to go in that direction. So how can you uh, improve computer systems in general, I'm using computer systems as a general uh, umbrella term or databases is one of the computer systems, but yeah. many other things can be can be done as well. And we're seeing this happening a little bit. Uh, you know, I think it can, you know, DBTune is an example, but we've seen, for example, Microsoft announcing uh, automation in index tuning uh, at the uh, developer conference that they had a couple of weeks ago, which is extremely exciting. Uh, we've seen some other companies trying to uh, move the needle in terms of query tuning as well, which is, which is great. So all these efforts go into this uh, umbrella category of um, using machine learning to optimize computer systems, specifically databases in this context here. And that's, I think, extremely exciting. There's so much to do. Um, we will see a lot of very cool innovation in the area, in my opinion, in the next five, 10 years. Great. Well, yeah, that sounds all pretty exciting. Um, I think that's it for our direct chat, but we've got time for questions. Um, to the floor here. Questions. Floor is open. Yeah. Could you tell us more about like where that data is coming from that's teaching that regression model, like the coefficient of which parameters work? Right. So the uh, data comes from things like uh, pgstat statements, which is an extension of Postgres that allows you to measure performance in the Postgres instance. And uh, Linux level uh, tools that allow you to measure CPU usage, memory usage, disk usage, I guess. And so the combination of these two things will gather all this kind of monitoring data that you need to then learn uh, and, and train this this uh, model. Okay. And if I recall correctly, like you said it was like a combination of So it's a, it's a combination of things that we've learned in the past that are already part of a prior learning, yeah. right? So you have, think about, I, if, you, if you did your one-on-one -on -one in statistics or, or, or probability theory, you usually have the idea of prior, likelihood, and the combination of these two will give you a posterior, mm -hmm. right? So the prior is what you know about the world prior to seeing what's going on. The likelihood function is you're observing something, you're gathering data now, and that's what you know the world is telling you about what's happening right now. And so that's the likelihood function. And now you want to have a combination of this prior together with the likelihood. So the prior will help you to optimize faster, basically because you have this understanding of the world, which is already encoded in the model. And then you have this likelihood function, which is telling you, hey, what you know about the world is great, but look, now it's this is what's happening right now. So you want to take care of, 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 of this uh, new data. And the combination of these two things give you this posterior model, which is which is what you care about. And, and it's really a combination of the two that gets you uh, on, on a fast uh, optimization. Because if you only had this part, the likelihood part, uh, you would probably not be as effective and efficient in, in getting to the optimal uh, optimal solution to the problem. So it's a combination of the two that gets you in this very fast three hour long optimization session. Um, otherwise, it would, it would take longer and um, get quick So I'm assuming that like this information about the prior is like what you proprietary about. Uh, well, it's it's that's that's correct. Uh, but it, there, there is also you know just the way we train the models and the way we. Uh, there's a lot of like deep, deep thinking on how you actually train the models. Um, we want to be able to just observe for, for, for three hours and then just give you this uh, solution. So you need to be extremely uh, data efficient. Uh, this is called in, 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 in the machine learning area, it's called statistical efficiency. So you want to observe a bunch and you will really be able to really learn very much. So a lot of the intellectual properties really on, on how you do that very efficiently, um, data efficiently. 
right? Uh, uh, and then, um, and then there is the um, safe uh, operation side of things, which is, you know, making sure that everything is done in a very safe manner. Um, so an another example of guardrail uh, and safe uh, operations is, for example, if you try a the, the engine tries a configuration that is now not performing as well uh, because the solution doesn't go always up. You may try something that seems interesting, but perhaps it's not as interesting. The performance may go down a little bit like this, and that's something that is not really not very uh, nice for 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 a database that is now performing worse than what it was doing. And so we basically learn a model that uh, uh, that basically integrates this information feedback loop that it's not, look, it's not going well. And so in, in a very short amount of time, he again reverts back to something that is uh, safer to use, and not, not just safer, but highly higher performing. Uh, and so there is another model, for example, that um, manages this uh, kind of failure mode uh, type of thing. You're not failing in the sense you're crashing your system, but you're failing in the sense that you're improving the performance of your system. Uh, and so this, uh, you know, this, these are all the things that need to kind of be taken into account and considered as a whole. To uh, keep this uh, you know, safely and, and effectively and efficiently. What is DBAS? DBAS is database as a service. DBAS, D B A A S, database as a service. And it's basically RDS. RDS Postgres or RDS Aurora or Azure Flexible Server or Google Cloud SQL. And the idea is that they uh, run. Um, some of the things that you would need to do manually if you're uh, self-managing your instance. For example, backups. If you, if you install Postgres and you're running Postgres yourself, you need to do backups uh, every, every now and then. And you do it by yourself manually, but if you're using a DBAS, a lot of as a service, uh, like uh, Postgres, uh, yes, Postgres, uh, then uh, they will do backups for you. You just pay and they do backups. So we we have uh, we have uh, security protocols and things that you know our users can learn from, and um, we are going through the journey of becoming soft to compliant as well, which hopefully will become um, uh, something that we will have. Uh, in, it takes a little bit of time; it's a really long process, but we have a bunch of things already. Is there a software running in a uh, isolated environment? It, it, can, it can run on an isolated, isolated environment uh, as a no prod uh, environment, or it can also run in your production system. Uh, it's, um, so usually you get uh, benefit, which is based on the size of your instance. Okay, so the pricing model is very simple. Uh, it's based on the number of cores that you have, and it's a subscription model uh, on a monthly or yearly basis. So if you have only a core or two, it's very cheap. And if you have a big instance, uh, then you will basically save much more uh, cost running your one business. And so the price goes up with respect to the number of cores. This is very similar to um, cloud um, pricing model. Uh, in the cloud, you usually pay for the number of cores. Um, in, a, in a fast solution, for example, you have two cores, you pay X. Uh, if you have four cores, you pay two times x, something like that. Uh, and um, it's similar to that, but it's, of course, much cheaper than uh, renting a DBAS because that's what we optimize for. You just want to take a little percentage of what you need to basically save. Thank you. And there is, by the way, a, um, there, is a, there is a trial. Um, you can use it for a full month. And you can optimize three database instances uh, for free, and it's uh, Few questions. So, uh, first question is: Does DB2 work on another database besides Postgres? It does. We have uh, run uh, DB2 on five different database management systems. Um, we wanted to see if the 
the same strategy would uh, apply to both relational uh, and relational in memory and NoSQL. And so we run this on five different systems, uh, Postgres, MySQL, RocksDB, which is behind um, Facebook and, and um, Instagram, and um, FoundationDB, which is behind iCloud, and some of the VMware products as well. Many, many pretty heavy used NoSQL uh, systems, and also SCP HANA. Uh, however, um, right now, we want to be really Needs are focused on, on Postgres, and so the, the thing that we are shipping right now is only Postgres. So we know that it works on the other systems, and we have done proof of concept. We can show performance results on those. Um, so there is not very much more research to be done. We could run on those systems. But in terms of product, we have we only ship um, Postgres for now. So we are pretty much a Postgres shop right now. Okay. Uh, second question is about the this predictive optimization. So, how does it work like, to generate the cost function? Does it does your agent uh, make the changes on the database, then uh, measures the performance another time, and it's an iterative process? Or how does it yes, that's correct. So that's something I should have been a little more precise when I was talking about this before. So it's a, it's an iterative process. Each iteration has a change in the configuration. And after a few iterations, you get to this optimal configuration of the system. And it does it does it all automatically. You can watch it happening on the dashboard. So the region has a dashboard, web dashboard, which uh, shows the you know the changes uh, in your performance of your instance. And uh, you can uh, stop it whenever you want. Otherwise, you just drink your coffee, go have, have lunch, and it's just happening. Uh, you, you can watch it and monitor it. But you don't need to take any manual action. Okay, so it should happen like you're in uh, like a major stem cell with a great performance. No, not really, because you want to you want to actually see what's going on on the machine. If you're doing it a, on a maintenance log, you don't see what's happening on the machine. It's a maintenance log. Okay, so you so want to have you want to have it running when the action is happening. But doesn't the the execution of that uh, those scripts that you have degrade the so it's a three hour long process. Okay. So it's possible that for a few minutes, uh, here and there, the performance may go down from the baseline. Because of DB2. Because of DB2. But the, uh, op the optimization space is designed in a way that the performance will never go like super low. And there are all these guardrails that bring you back to the higher performance as soon as we see that there is a lower performance. Since the thing is monitoring continuously, it can react very quickly. So if there is a lower performance for, for, for a minute, you can bring it up back to a separate configuration um, by changing configuration, bring it back to uh, another higher configuration. So it's dynamic. There, there will be small moments during those three hours, only during those three hours, right? So this is uh, changing the configuration during those three hours, and maybe moments where it's not high performing. And so there will be a little bit of this, but then eventually we're converging to the high performing uh, and uh, we ensure that the lower performing moments are actually much uh, short, very short, uh, because we monitor and we can react very quickly. Okay, so let me just, say, just time check, we got one more question, or one more uh, minute for a question. We'll get back to you in a second, does anyone else have what they'd like to ask? Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So you So technically, if you have a, like a read heavy and a write heavy um, instance, the configuration of those two instances are actually very different. So ideally, what you would like to do is to have a configuration for this one and a configuration for this one, which are, I can tell you, very different. Uh, and so we had, for example, um, uh, Bit Bit Capco uh, in, in India recently. It's, uh, I talk about them because I can't disclose their name. They were nice enough to allow us to talk about this. So they, for example, run DB2 on, on the uh, read, read only, and they were optimizing the read only. That's what they wanted to do. And, um, and so in that case, the 
configuration of the system wasn't the same configuration we thought we'd have in the right heavy. But that was the optimal way of, of doing that because the heavy would have been a much different um, configuration of, of the right heavy. What happens during the Well, it was it would still work if you don't make any change in the configuration. It would still work, but the performance would not be optimal. Now, depending on how you manage your failover, your failover, you can you can decide to have the configuration uh, that was used in the, in the right heavy uh, setting, then use that one instead. Uh, so that depends a little bit on how you want to do it. Our so we, we are product focused companies. So we don't offer a lot of service in general because we, we are a product company, but we do offer a little bit of service. Initially, we we do this with our with our uh, customers. We help them to understand all these different options. Uh, and once it is set up, you don't need us anymore. You would not want to talk to us anymore. <laughs> once it is set up, right? And you just uh, basically uh, you know this is basically happening and running, and it's always optimal and that's convenient for you, but the integration phase, you may want to maybe uh, learn from us what's the best way to do this based on your requirements and your environment and so on. Yeah, sure. So you said that uh, three hours window you do the monitoring, right? And suppose you put your agents on the production machine. On the what, sorry? On the production machine. Production machine. So are you going to bounce the server on the background? Are you going to change the parameters? So if it's in production and you're monitoring the production system, and you're changing the production system. Say, how do you so, avoid bouncing? Are you going server? to bounce the Postgres server, or how are you going to change the parameters? About bouncing. I mean, if, if, if you bounce it. certain parameters, you need to stop and start the engine, right? All right. So that's that's a great question. So the um, parameters that we tune are basically well known parameters, unless your application um, cares about. So unless your application allows us to do restarts. So there are, there are two parameters that are important for restarts, the shared buffers and max worker processes. Those two parameters, we will recommend some values for you. In a maintenance window, you can set them up. But all the other parameters that we tune are reload only. So you don't, you don't have downtimes. You can change them, but you, you're basically using reloads. So you, there is no downtime whatsoever. So this just happens uh, with, with you no know, downtimes, and it can happen as many times as, 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 as we want that. Right. We don't we don't change your system a million times, but we change we change it a few few times, but, but only with it. And uh, one more thing, you said that uh, when the performance goes down, you go back. So go back means uh, suppose your system is going out of memory, you start killing the connections, or what you do at time. So when uh, we so this is the guardrails uh, thing that I was mentioning. There are a bunch of guardrails. One of them is the memory. Uh, so now what's happening is that. Tune basically installed a configuration that is using a little too much memory. You're getting 90% of memory usage, and that's bad. You don't want to have that configuration. So we basically remove that configuration, uh, use another configuration. The configuration we mark it as unsafe to use because it's using too much memory, and the system will never go back to doing something like that. So the system will basically learn that there is a region in this optimization space which is for your application specifically, it's not safe to use. Perhaps it's safe for her, perhaps it's safe for him, but it's not safe for you. And that's that's what he's learning in, in real time. Um, and so it basically you know, changes the configuration uh, and in a way that you don't have this 90% uh, memory usage anymore. And this is compatible on all the Postgres versions? Or? So right now, Postgres, um, community Postgres is maintained from G12 to PG16. And we do support all those and we will always support whatever whatever Postgres supports. We also support PG11 just because we started uh, a little while ago and it wasn't a lot of overhead for us to support that one as well. So from PG11 to PG16, which is what we have today. Well, I think we're going to wrap the questions in stuff here or we'll be around for another 15 or 20 minutes yeah y'all we have the spot until eight o'clock i want to say thank you to rashad and luigi awesome. very much
I want to say thank you to Materialize for having us in their space and for getting way too much pizza and beer. So why don't we all have another slice, hang out for another 20 minutes. The space is ours until 8. Thank you so much for coming. Awesome.